to start with the engineering study agreement with Unitil. Sure. Go ahead. That's uh, Jennifer's been coming. So, and I apologize for not being here last time to answer your questions, but I did hear um, some feedback comment last time that we were looking for a better defined scope. And really, what is it that the money is being given to Unitil for? Um, and, and what do we get for that? So there's been two rounds. So in front of you is a cover letter uh, and the Unitil contract that uh, was for $180,000. That is all related to what is really needs to be defined, and I've gone back and defined it even more, so a little of this is going to be discussion. It's sort of two phases to what uh, the intentions are. The intentions in working with Unitil and eventually the other utility companies is looking at what is the feasibility? What are those options of removing the overhead utility wires to some other configuration? So whether it's from the rear of some of the properties, whether it's underground, whether it's a combo of two, it's truly trying to figure out what is it that we're going to do? Can it be done? Again, the word feasible in a feasibility study is, is it possible? What are the costs associated with it? And um, being able to use that information for your next steps. So that's really what this stage one is. So I went back to Unitil again after I provided this uh, for the board. And so here's my apology for having new information that you don't have in front of you. And I said, John, this is a turn over at Unitil. I said, can you explain to me the breakdown of the 180,000? Is Unitil using all of this money? Because originally, the 180,000, as it spells here, was these feasibility study and construction documents. So it was taking one of those chosen, if we went forward, putting into construction documents that you would put out to the street and you would bid, and all the design and specifications, so the engineering that would go with it. I said, well, that makes it really confusing since we don't know which way we're going. We don't know what solution we're going for. I said, what is the cost for moving forward with this feasibility part? What are our options? What land would we need? What easements? Those type of things. So John sent me back the cost for that, and that's 32500 So as a recommendation, I don't suggest we move forward with the $180,000, as my letter said because we don't know which way we're moving forward. But to move forward with the feasibility component, which is trying to determine can we, can we have an option to put wires underground from the back in some other configuration that exists today? What would that cost? And then let Experience Hampton do what they had said they were gonna do, look for funding, look for ways to accomplish that. But to use the money that was approved through the warrant process, to look and do that feasibility study and that money to Unitil for, which is now a revised 32,000. So I apologize that didn't come to you the first time. It took some while to get myself caught up uh, <coughs> on, but I feel like we've called them, we've uh, worked it out, and I needed to explain that to you. So I hope I've just explained that a little bit better. All right, open up the discussion in the board. Uh, Phil, do you want to? You want me to rain on the parade first? Sure. Um, yeah. uh, look, I get the warrant article process, and I, I get uh, the town warrant, and, and this thing goes. So this is a, a an engineering study agreement, and it's titled "A Town of Hampton Downtown Underground." That's, that's the title of the agreement. That's what they're looking at, looking at putting utilities downtown. Yeah, it's, it's it's kind of generic and, and for me problematic, and we we as a board spoke at the last. About uh, for costs, and I don't think this document uh, satisfies that that standard any more than where we were at the last time, and uh, it raises more questions than it answers now. Uh, and again, I understand there was a warrant, and I understand that I voted for it. Um, and, and here it is. It's 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 got in the first subparagraph. There's four things: provide a scope and cost estimate of all labor and materials to remove the electrical facilities in the affected area. That is the responsibility of the company. Um, I'm a layman, but I you know I have a business. Uh, Jim has been in business. I mean, some of the rights have been in business. People have a, a pretty good feel for what those things cost. And I think Unitil, uh, you say they're a monopoly for electric around here. Is that correct? 
They are. Yeah, I think supply. they. I think they have a pretty good feel for that without charging um, their only captive customer. And I'm just going to go on for a couple of things and get to it, um, uh, including but not limited to an existing condition survey information and AutoCAD drawings of civil engineering of the affected area. That's our responsibility. Is this states? Is that and correct? We've already had that done. Okay. So we've got that. How much did that cost us? Twenty-eight thousand. All right, twenty-eight thousand. Is that twenty-eight thousand out of the three hundred thousand? Yes. That's already been. Did we sign a? Uh, uh, we brought order? before two proposals. We had solicited two proposals, survey proposals, and we had gone with. Okay. Uh, so important to note, Phil, though, and I don't mean to interrupt, but yeah. not just for this. Right. That survey is for our sewer design or drainage design. Okay. And so, what portion of that uh, twenty-eight thousand is uh, a portion? You don't have to answer it right now to this three hundred thousand dollar limit. I don't see that. Um, and then it says there's going to be two to three conceptual designs. Is it two or is it three? A third uh, more, a third less. I think that's a big issue, especially when you're talking. People uh, are looking at one hundred eighty thousand dollars. That's a huge thing. Two or three, one or two. No. Is it three or is it two? Is it 180 grand for three or is it 120 grand for two? Uh, it also talks about land rights to be procured. Now we're getting into eminent domain. Now we're getting into attorneys. Uh, I could be wrong. I know a little bit about real estate, not that much, but when we're talking land rights to be procured, um, that to me uh, sounds serious. All they'd be doing is identifying what. We actually are not, or we're year, well, we're months away from actually trying to procure. But in other words, their conceptual designs, be they okay. two or three, would identify. Well, we need an easement on this parcel. We need an easement on this parcel. We need a taking on this parcel. Okay. Um, in the I, end, these things may prove to be very problematic. And, and, and I'm going to defer to. Uh, Mr. Welch on these things and the town attorney, of course, um, but land rights and uh, takings in eminent domain are serious issues. And then it says an order of magnitude cost estimates. This is under stage one after they be procured by the customer. And that means the town is going to be responsible for taking these, not, not uh, Experience Hampton, not the Hampton Chamber. This is the customer, and that's the town. So we will be involved in takings, and Mr. Welch, I'll defer to you. But then it says, and order of magnitude cost estimates. What is that? That's so we get an understanding that when they do the concepts two or three, what would they cost to actually implement, to construct? Right. So okay. we can determine if it's feasible. Okay. And then um, stage two, uh, the con it will include construction plans to be provided to the customer's contractor. Uh, so this is the construction documents. If it's if it's proven feasible, and if there's funding available, they would then provide the construction drawings to a contractor. So many state like way beyond now, which is why I don't think moving forward with the 180. Is appropriate because you're not there. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm going uh, to. So defer that's to, what you just said. Yeah, to the rest of the board, I feel exactly <laughs> the same way. I don't think it's anywhere near precise enough. But she does feel confident moving forward. Forward with the 32. 32, because that's what gives us the cost to determine if it's feasible. Right. What the options be? It would identify hurdles. It would identify if there were land constraints or easements that were needed, <laughs> so that uh, I, I want to call it the educated decision. It would answer questions as to, you know, Unitil would own, you know, primary, primary, excuse me, primary lines, you know, if okay. it were constructed. So I think that there's some of these uh, things are let, exactly let me, what you're let me just for. let me just get out so the rest of the board. But on, on the June 20th letter, I don't see anything about. I, maybe I'm going blind. No, I, I, don't I see, didn't have it. I don't see anything about 32,000. <laughs> I didn't have it then. I don't see anything about that and the detailed stuff, and I'm, I'm not sorry. going anywhere near it. That's Fred to Thank respond you. to your thing. Yeah. No, I'm back to the chamber. Thank you. I'd like Fred to respond to what he just said. Okay, well, let's go to the board first and then yeah. go to Fred. I think I see the 180,000, and then I see this. Right, and that was my apology. And this is the whole what they're supposed to do from start to beginning. We've already paid for 28000 of it because we had to do a certain part of it. No. no. And again, I'm going to have to take full responsibility here because I went to further clarify after the deadline of giving you this. What you have in front of you is 180000 which would take it from the feasibility, the, de the conceptual designs, that right. stage one like you see there, yeah. through 
construction drawings once things were decided. My further refinement in why I'm saying why are we going to go in to pay for constructions and specifications and those type of things? Let's do the study. Let's find out what it would cost and what our options are. And I found out that number after what's in front of you, so you right. do not have it. And that is the 32500 It's basically stage one <coughs> on so, that little thing. So my cover letter that you have on top of Unitil's thing does not explain right. what I've explained to you tonight. So would it be possible to get something from Unitil that shows what will be done for the 32,500 yeah, study? It, it's going to be okay. those, um, it, it makes yes. sense for me right. to refine it and the answer is yes. Okay. Thank you. So, and the whole intent of the Warren article was for a feasibility study, if I... Yes, because the final construction and you know the, the final final plan the actual doing the work is you know experiences Hampton has said that they're going to be responsible for raising the funds for that so this really is just a feasibility so and this is just say phase one phase one of seeing what the feasibility is yeah. without having to buy all the plans right it, it, yes and after this they may come back and say to you the the cost to do option one is 1.5 million option two is two and a quarter and option combination of one and two which is the option three is 3.3 million which one would you like to do and it's up to experience Hampton to raise the funds and if they don't you get the <coughs> plug on the whole thing because as Phil has just pointed out it, it is a contract with the town and UNITO ultimately I would like to uh, speak. Okay, go. Um, I'd like Fred to respond to uh, what Phil said. And I would also like to know, uh, how did this work over at Exeter when they d determined that they could not afford to put the uh, utilities underground? Uh, did that happen, or did the people over there vote not to do it? But I know that they were planning on putting the utilities underground, and in the end they decided, I think at a cost of over $4 million, it was too much. Um, and the other thing, I'd like to know more about what happened of, of the idea of putting the utilities out on the train tracks or back there. That'd be one of those options. Okay. Yeah. There are a number of options to do this, obviously. <clears throat> The reason you're getting 32500 in front of you tonight is because I had a long conversation with Public Works, and there are a number of things here that haven't been settled yet. First of all, we don't even know if we have a route that we can use because no one has even talked to the people along Lafayette Road to find out whether or not we can go behind those buildings, either overhead or underground. And they may not all have to be gone behind. It's, it's a matter of uh, one person can stop the whole process if they say no. They don't want to give an easement. By law, utilities cannot enjoy the use of someone's private property except by easement. That's a state law. So we need to, we need to sort of get through that, and the $32,500 will satisfy that, one of those requirements, to find out exactly whether or not it's feasible to put those <coughs> overhead or underground down behind existing properties or whether or not uh, they could be put underground uh, down Lafayette Road. As you know, we have a lot of utilities on Lafayette Road, and we'll have to work amongst them in order to get an underground line, and if that's where it needs to go. I think that uh, you'll never get an answer to the question if you don't do this, but we need to make sure, if it's done, that the answer to the question comes back for no more than $32,500. That's a lot of money to spend for something that you're going to own, we're going to build, and we're going to have to own and maintain it forever. Because at the meeting when Unitel described this, they're not going to maintain the system. They're not going to own it. The town is. Unless they change that position, we're going to be in the electric distribution business. That's, that's the bottom line here. I don't know how much this system will cost, and, and neither does anyone else until they actually out, go out and do the survey. So. In order to get answers to all these different questions, for instance, what size conduit do you need? Uh, do you need 12-inch conduit? Do you need 15-inch conduit for 
13,500 volt cable, three phase. Uh, you know, what if they're running 4650? <coughs> what if they're running 7600? There are a whole number of issues that need to be resolved here. And how are they going to run them? Is there going to be pole lines behind existing properties coming down uh, um, Lafayette Road? Or if people won't allow that, do they have to actually take an easement and excavate down behind all those properties? But that's what the feasibility that's study... That's what the feasibility study will tell you, all the answers to all these various questions, so you'll have a general idea of what's going on here and whether or not you can, you can proceed in any one fashion or a number of fashions to get the work done if the town decides to do it. Okay. But I'm going to ask, is the board will allow John Nyan to speak because Experience Hampton is involved in this. They wrote the Warren article. They're going to raise the money. If that's permissible... Anybody got an objection? Yeah, I do. Anybody else? Does he live in Hampton? John Nine? Yeah. yeah. John Nine, yeah. And here, here's the reason I don't is uh, this is a Warren article, and this is dealing with public works, and this is dealing with the Board of Selectmen. This is dealing with the town attorney. These are deeded rights. Uh, John Nine doesn't have an expertise in that. I don't have an expertise in that. Uh, but Mr. Welch does, Public Works does. We're in here tonight, Mr. Chairman. Uh, last week we asked for, for greater detail. There's been some um, good reasons that Jen doesn't have some things here today. And let me get that right on the record, that no one would argue with. And God bless you, young lady. Uh, and we asked for more detail. Now we're talking about $32,000 without a description, without anything written. We got a $180,000 cover letter, and uh, we've got an engineering study that's raising more questions than it asks. So Mr. Nine can add to the confusion, but I'll tell you, as a business owner and a guy that supported the Warren article, uh, it's going from bad to worse, and I would like this to start off in a much better, more professional manner. Thank I'll you. i make a motion that we allow John Nine to speak. I'll second. All in favor? I just want to discuss it. Uh, I would like to say uh, that I don't have any problem with John speaking, and I hope he can stay and to listen uh, as a, the head of the Hampton Area Commission to listen to the, what we're going to discuss that has to do with this Gentian Road because that area is something that is under the whatever of the Hampton Area Commission. So I hope John can stay. And then let me just ask: Would you like to speak? <laughs> Just for the record, uh, on this part of the conversation, John Nyan, to Walnut Avenue in Hampton, so I can live in Hampton. And um, my role t tonight in speaking is the president of Experience Hampton. Um, I had no intentions of coming up to speak um, after having f further discussions with uh, members of the management team of Public Works. Um, we have been going back and forth in discussions uh, in as much as that they have kept Experience Hampton up to date on what the plans are, which I think has been very appreciative. Um, when they uh, shared with us um, that they thought and, and Jen thought that uh, before we go any further, let's, uh, let's really break down that 180000 and she came up with uh, working and negotiating with Unitil that $32,000, which is the feasibility ability study and I think that's that was the intent from the very very beginning of experience Hampton's idea was the fact that is it possible to do what we would like to do a lot of people say yes a lot of people say no but the only way you're going to find it as as Mr. Welch said is through this feasibility study to determine once and for all is something like this doable and possible that's why we went out and raised the money uh, I should say through the Warren article to see what can be done on this and also made a financial commitment to that Warren article uh, on behalf of Experience Hampton. So that's all I have to say and um, you know I, I do uh, support uh, Jen's uh, idea of the, the, the new recommendation um, and I think I can speak for Experience Hampton. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Rusty. So Jen, we're not looking for the 180. Correct. We're looking for thirty-two five. Right. Thirty-two thousand five hundred. And you have that in writing. Yes. Is the board seen? Is the board seen it? We have not seen it. Correct. And may I, may I, Mr. Chairman? Yes. We've got a twenty-eight thousand dollar expenditure that we've got no allocation of costs associated with this project. Now we're starting to climb, which could be upwards of fifty thousand dollars. We don't have any documentation on this thirty-two thousand. It's a verbal, and it's not the way to do business. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Fred, your recommendation? Uh, I'd like to see the contract. I'm the one who's going to sign it. Uh, I'd like I mean, to know what the, I'm going to sign. As the director, I'd like to table this matter for another week. I have Jen uh, expand upon the uh, uh, proposal, uh, attach to it the documentation she has from Unitil. Yeah. I don't think, the, you know, certainly the project, the lines aren't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, let's. Uh, I would agree with uh, Selectman Bean that you need to have this fully in front of you. It's it's the way we do business, and we should do business here. A motion to table. I'll do. I'll second it. Rusty made it. Okay. All in favor, table in. Next right. meeting. Tabled. Thank you, Thank you Jen. And you'll Thank Jen. You'll have, you. next week. You'll have. Yeah, I'll get it in on the normal deadline, right. and you'll have the actual packet with the information that is correct this time. I just needed to explain it to you so you didn't think I did nothing from the last time. <laughs> Okay, waiver from purchasing policy, policy section 718-15 B and C for two-way radios. Yeah, um, I'm sure if that was actually this conversation occurred before. No, it didn't occur before this board. The conversation occurred uh, in our weekly staff meetings, uh, manager staff meetings on a Tuesday, and that was the discussion of radios and radios department-wide. Um, what initiated this whole discussion is when Aquarian wanted to um, have us move our gear off of their water tower prior to um, them getting ready to paint. It caused all of us, meaning police, fire, and public works, to start a discussion about, well, whose antenna is it, where should we replace it, can we move it to somewhere else, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was the suggestion of the police chief, which we wholeheartedly agree with, is that we sit down with Lieutenant Tom Goditis, uh, who is their coordinator for radios and communications, to see what they were doing <coughs> so that we were all on the same page. Um, one of the things that we're trying to achieve out of this is that we all have the same or similar capabilities, cross frequencies, cross equipment, <laughs> so that in the event of an emergency, um, be it a flood, be it a snow event, be it a whatever, um, they can communicate seamlessly with us and we can communicate seamlessly with them. Uh, certainly we don't get the same uh, level of radios or communication that the police get. I believe they have something where upwards to 30 channels that they can communicate over. You do. Uh, we're simply, I think, in the three-channel realm. Um, one where would be our normal communications, and then two would be, uh, in the event of emergency, they would tell us, we'll go to channel X, and we'll talk to you about barricades and evacuation routes and whatever on that. So we did. We sat down with Lieutenant, Lieutenant Goditis. Um, he suggested that he uses uh, two-way communications out of Newington. They um, service and provide all of their radios, um, and so we did. We reached out to them uh, as their primary provider, uh, with hopefully that this would be a seamless uh, process. In doing that, we had uh, two-way communications come in and look at our equipment top to bottom. Um, what we discovered um, was that we were we are still operating on an analog system, at least half of our equipment. Yeah, your eyebrows raised. Yeah. So did mine. Um, they're actually going to repair one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven vehicles. They've said we can take the radios out, we can reprogram them so that they can better communicate. A number of them need little things like antennas or power packs of things of that nature. We were operating with Kenwoods in about nine other vehicles. Uh, 31, 30, 11, uh, 25 is the van for the emergency pumping equipment, uh, 65, 82, 16. I know they're all numbers just to you, but to us, these are, a number of these are frontline um, snow plowing and emergency response uh, pieces of equipment. Uh, for instance, if we have to do evacuations, Unit 14 is our bus. That would be something that we would actually use. It would need this full line communication. So working with two-way communications, we said, well, first they came back and they gave me a contract for replacement radios. And I asked one simple question, digital or analog. Oh, they're analog. Well, guys, if we're, 
We're trying to move into this century. Uh, please, you know, the whole thing was so that we can communicate seamlessly with these other departments. Um, so they came back, um, and what was a would have been about a ten thousand dollar cost uh, blossomed to the twenty five thousand two hundred eighty two that you have before you. Um, you know, I could have been tried to lessen the order to lessen the impact, but as I've told my staff repeatedly. Um, Management sets the level of safety, and then and then we have to provide that level of safety. And to me, um, communications are, are key or critical to that, to the point that we have a number of we have several vehicles out there where they can hear us, but they can't respond presently. Um, we have others that they break up halfway through the communications. You get the first word, the seventh word, and the ninth word, and you're supposed to piece together what they said. It's. But it's why fine. do we need the waiver? So. I didn't, thank you, I'm, I'm probably, I was asked uh, by other in team in uh, upper management to be very um, clear as to how you got to this point. Don't. Mm -hmm. You're clear. Okay, thank you. We've heard it before. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so how we got to this point was um, we did reach out to Motorola. Motorola Solutions nationally provided this quote. This, they would end up, we would end up purchasing the radios through two-way communications in Newington, but from Motorola Solutions out of Chicago, Illinois. We, the reason why we're asking the waiver is we're sticking with the, uh, Jen wrote me down a note. Thank I did you. write you a note. The National. National Association of State Procurement Officials, it's a national bid or a New England bid provided through the states, um, and it even lists, uh, if we had any questions, talk to Jeffrey Haley at NewHampshire.gov. So this is what uh, state police would use, what Fire Department would use, Police Department would use, it's a national bit. And we're asking permission to use that to replace said nine radios for some total of... I'll make that motion. That's not a waiver. If it's a state bid... We have to be clear on that. So it's an, I'm, I'm going to just clarify because I want everybody to be clear because that's the importance of making sure that we're doing this and we're doing it right. The state of New Hampshire through... NASPO, it's a multi-state contract. Doesn't make any difference as long as the state of New Hampshire approved it, and within that approval, there is a provision for the town to accept the approval. The price yes. is offered in the terms and conditions of the contract will be extended to nonprofit organizations, county, cities, town, school districts, special districts, or precincts, and governmental subdivisions in the college. So That's all you need, plus an approval from the board of selectmen to spend the money under a state contract. So there you I go. I make that motion. <laughs> I'll second it. Discussion, Phil. No, sir. Thank you. Rick? Regina? So, we will have the, you, you will have the same as police? Similar quality, not as many bands, but okay. yes. But the same? Similar, fre same and similar frequencies and, and... Okay, so you'll be able to communicate with them seamlessly? Correct. Fire? They're going to be, they're still running some analog radios and they're trying to move into the digital platform too. Okay. But theirs are much more extensive radios than ours. And it is not a waiver. It is not a waiver because there is a provision within the purchasing policy to use state and federal contracts okay. with the board's permission. Okay. Provided they have that qualification clause and she just read it. Okay. <coughs> All in favor? Opposed? Unanimous? Thank you very much. You're not leaving, right?